Welcome to the Uptime Wind Energy Podcast, where we feature the latest advancements in wind energy technology. I'm your host, Alan Hall, president of WeatherGuard Lightning Tech, along with my co-host, Joel Saxon, vice president of North American Sales for Wind Power Lab. We're at Wind Europe 2023 in Copenhagen, Denmark, so celebrating all the new technology and industries in wind. Today, we have a very special guest joining us, Daniela Roper, founder and CEO of Borealis Wind, a leading company in the wind turbine blade anti-icing sector. Borealis Wind has been in the forefront of developing cutting-edge anti-icing tech solutions for wind turbine blades. Their innovative technology has helped to increase the efficiency and reliability of wind turbines, making them more viable in colder climates. In this episode, Daniela will be sharing her expertise on the importance of anti-icing solutions in the wind power industry, the challenges faced in developing these solutions, and how Borealis Wind has been able to overcome them and become a leader in the field. So join us as we learn more about the exciting work being done by Borealis Wind and gain valuable insights from Daniela. So Daniela, welcome to the Uptime Podcast. Thank you very much. So it's been a, it's already been a busy week in Copenhagen and we're in a place obviously where it's cold. Yeah. <laughs> Yesterday the <laughs> weather was miserable. This morning too. The yeah. wind was blowing and it was people had headdresses on and <laughs> right. hats and jackets and everything. So we see a lot of icing. I assume up here in Denmark and Sweden and Norway, we were just in Sweden, uh, a lot of icing, a lot of problems. It seems like the, not coming from an extremely cold climate, where you are from in Canada, icing is a regular occurrence. Yeah, I think when Canadians are, particularly we work in Quebec, when we look at icing in the rest of the world, it doesn't look that bad. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it definitely in these colder climates, there are icing problems. So the, the operators are losing somewhere upwards. I've seen numbers at times of 20, 30, 40 percent in yeah. a particular month in terms of energy production because it just shut down. Yeah. Once ice accumulates, that's it. Unless it fall, once it falls off, you can start up again, but you, you can't really run with ice on your blades. Yeah, exactly. Most turbines are fairly sensitive to ice buildup and they will stop themselves once they determine that there's ice buildup. And it really depends on the control parameters of the turbine and the operator, I guess right. the uh, manufacturer of the turbine and how they've set it up. Some are more sensitive than others. And um, that's because icing can be quite damaging to the turbine if it's, uh, right. if it's severe, yeah. yeah. So the, the damage mechanisms now, you're talking uh, fatigue, early life fatigue, right? Mm -hmm. It's one of them, of course. And then you're talking ice throw ice damage. I mean, on the wind power lab side, we see a lot of these things. Yeah. And so, so for the listeners, think of this. Sometimes a piece of ice coming off of a, a wind turbine blade can be the size of the hood of a car. Yeah. Right. And if it's throwing it up in the air or throwing it out, it's dangerous to people, but also it could throw it up in the air and then the next blade, it can come around and hit it. Yeah. And that icing impact damage is what we see. I mean, that, that goes as far as sometimes you can't fix it. Yeah. Sometimes that's a blade replacement. Right, yeah. and it gets into the structural side of things. So the, the the damages and the risks are real here if it's not controlled. Yeah, yeah. I was actually in the nacelle of a turbine when a chunk of ice, probably the size of a hood of a car, yeah. fell on the roof of the nacelle, and that was terrifying. The noise that made. <laughs> yeah. Oh my goodness. Wow. So as we as we continue continue to put wind turbines in tougher climates, all the good wind with but the least amount of ice is pretty much taken up already. So now we're on that perimeter. So we're, we're pushing into more icing areas. What happens next? Because I think the OEMs have some sort of kind of solutions that they're, they're implementing at times, but it's always not the greatest for a particular environment as you're seeing. Well, I think the OEMs have offered some solutions. What I've I mean, I'm really passionate about the problem of icing and the solution yeah. of blade <laughs> sure. heating. So I think they haven't put enough effort into what they're offering. Okay. There are really good wind resources in cold climates that unfortunately will have bad icing conditions, but it's something that can be addressed with blade heating. Okay. So that's where we get into Borealis Wind. And you started Borealis Wind back when? It's okay. So I started the company when I finished mechanical my me, mechanical engineering degree in uh, 2015. Okay. So the company started officially at the beginning of 2016. Young, naive Daniela, thinking, "Hey, you know, we'll put heat in blades. It won't be that complicated." Yeah. Um, turns out it's very complicated. But so started in uh, 2016 with the idea of uh, circulating warm air inside the blade to prevent ice buildup. 
That has developed a lot since then. So we're still using this hot air blade de-icing method of blade heating. Okay. Um, and we have really refined the product at this point. So we've installed over 20 systems in Canada and have five winters of operational validation for our systems. Wow, okay, so can you dive into what the system is, how it generically works? It's a hot air system, Yeah. but it's a little, maybe a little bit different than other systems I have seen. So you want to describe yeah. like what's what's all inside the box here? Of yeah, the okay, perfect. System. So I don't know if this is worth explaining, probably all of your listeners know this, but wind turbine blades are hollow. They typically have a shear web that runs down the center of them that separates the leading edge and the trailing edge. Right. And so, and that shear web um, gives the blade stiffness, and that also um, gives us an opportunity to prevent airflow from going into the trailing edge. So we can specifically target the heat in the leading edge cavity where you have the most ice buildup normally on the sure. outside of the blade. So inside the leading edge cavity, at the root of the blade, we uh, mount a blower, an electric resistive heater, okay. and then we run fabric ducting all the way to the very tip of the blade and we force the heat to the tip as much as we can, and we target the end third of the blade. So that's the area where we have a lot of convective heat loss while the turbine's running, sure. and also icing is normally the worst there. And then we allow, we release the air from the duct, we allow it to recirculate back and then continue heating that way. Okay. A couple of things I've heard there that I really like. Fabric ducting. Yeah. Because uh, from the blade point of view, uh, lightning, risk with a weather guard sitting here, yeah. uh, not wanting to, you know, change the factory LPS systems or in, involve any kind of ducting that would be metal or anything convective up there, that's key, right? Yes, um, And exactly. then I think when we had talked uh, off there before, the actual power junction box where the heater is, is right in the root, correct? Exactly, yeah. So then it's kind of inert from the LPS system risks there as well. You're not going to attract a wrong lightning attachment. In the root section. Right. I mean, I hope not. Uh, if anybody has seen that, please, please let us know. <laughs> that's crazy. Um, but yes, yeah, so the the system then resides inside of basically the the root plate of the blade. The heater does, or where does the heater sit? Uh, the heater and the blower are at the very kind of beginning of the shear web inside the blade. Okay. Okay. And then um, you guys have, I think we talked before as well. You've been had DNV take a peek at the system, and they yeah, we just received our component certificate uh, for the one of the versions of our design. So for the Siemens 3.2 turbines, we received our component certificate, and then for each turbine model um, adjustments we make, we have to have a kind of recertification of it. Yeah, but yeah. that's much easier than the first one. So anybody with a Siemens 3.2, yep, that's got icing problems. DNV says it's ready to go. Yep. Today. Yeah. Today. So what does that system do if you're adapting to a GE 1.5? Is there anything that really changes in the system or, or is it just scaling it down a little bit for the shorter blades? It's pretty much just scaling it down. Okay. So I guess I'll quickly explain one more thing about our system. So our focus has been on ease of installation, ease of maintenance okay. and reliability. So everything that could need to be maintained is either we put it in the hub so that it's really easy to access or we put it right at the root of the blade. Um, and those components we've also standardized as much as possible. And um, we can use the same blower and heater in different blade lengths. Of course, we can adjust the size of the um, heater. Yeah, right. of the okay. heater. yeah right. exactly. Yeah. yeah, especially if you go offshore or something, you need a 100 meter blade, right. you're going right. to need a, yes. a lot hell of, of heat. a heater in there. <laughs> so, so the heating system, let's just take standard right now, that Siemens 3.2. Yeah. What is the power draw of that heating system? Just to kind of get a little bit more technical information around it. So in those blades, we are drawing about 30 kilowatts of heat okay. per blade. Okay. Yeah. And those, I mean, our system, so we have uh, some Siemens 3.2s that are nice in class three, which is a bit more severe, but also some nice in class two. Mm -hmm. And I say in class two, we're only drawing about, uh, I think it's 22 kilowatts. Okay. Um, but oh, then in sure. the harsh icing climates, okay. we're drawing a little bit more power. So, so some more, I mean, getting some more metric details then. Okay. So say we say Joel Wind Farm decides they want to install the system. How many days or how many hours is my turbine down while you install it? It takes about a week to do the installation. Okay. And the way we do the installation, it's completely up tower. Mm -hmm. So we enter the blade as you would to do an internal blade repair. We position the blade horizontally. We, we do the lotto procedure. Um, and we spend about two days per blade doing the installation. And the turbine can actually operate overnight during this period. Oh, so nice. it's not oh, as sure. much downtime. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Sure. 
Yeah. But it's that you're you're taking a week of downtime to save weeks of downtime in the future. Yeah. Right. Exactly. So that's, the, that's the ROI there. Yeah. Okay. And then I know what we talked about as well. So this is and this was a something you mentioned the other day when we talked, and I really enjoyed it because I've seen a lot of blades. If anybody's in the wind industry, you've seen pictures of blades. You've been around blades, and there's always this like the tiny access hole. Yeah. And I look at that in the end of the blade and the blade root there, and I go like, I don't. I got to stop eating so many cheeseburgers. <laughs> there's no way I'm going to be able to get in that thing. And, and you had said, yes, there is standard like 500 millimeters across. Yeah, that's the sta that's the minimum um, entrance diameter. Yeah. So all your parts are made specifically to fit. Sometimes it's modular, right? You're taking it apart to, to yeah. get through that yeah. access hole. Because I mean, I've seen them before. I was on a, a blade inspection one time with one of our blade specialists. And luckily, uh, her name's Aura. She's fantastic. Luckily, she's really small. <laughs> and she's just like, bloop, bloop. And I'm looking and I was like holding a flashlight for her. And I was like, I don't think I could get through there. Um, so kudos to the blade techs that are climbing in these things that can, can make that happen for themselves. So there's a question for you. Now we're trying to, we're, we're digging into here, uh, people listening to it. What we hope is that they're interested. They want to move forward, right? Yeah. That's the idea. Uh, we're, 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 you know, uptime podcast trying to bring new tech to the market to get you guys some traffic and to solve some of the problems in the wind industry. So uh, from an operations and maintenance standpoint, what, what kind of issues do you run into normally? Or is it like, like an iPhone and it just works. Okay, with our first systems, it wasn't like an iPhone, it just works. <laughs> yeah. Okay, do iPhones work? I guess so. That's an argument for a different day. Okay, that's an argument for a different day, yeah. Um, so we, we typically do two maintenances per year, one in the fall before icing season and then one at the end of the icing season. And we have, over the last five years, sort of figured out what is the right maintenance interval for different components. Yep. Uh, so we have... A procedure now that we follow and it's been going very smoothly we had really high availability of our systems this winter most systems were at 100 percent availability oh, which wow. is what we want that's great yeah yeah, yeah fantastic so are All you right. turning it are you saying okay operator xyz they say the forecast says we might have a storm coming that could develop an icing issue we start the heaters now or do you wait until the blades are iced up this is something that several people have talked about here at, yeah. at this conference so okay so we are measuring liquid water content and if you're a nerd about icing you've heard about how liquid water content has the best correlation to when an icing event happens mm -hmm. so we are using a sensor uh, called the ice tech sensor it's from a company in quebec canada so when they measure icing conditions they're looking for liquid water content um, and that tells us when the icing event is starting that's before there's even ice on the blades and that's when we start the heating system Perfect. And it's very, their sensor is extremely accurate. So um, we start heating as soon as we know the icing conditions have started. We keep heating as long as there are icing conditions and the turbine is underperforming. And once the turbine's at full performance, icing event is over, then we stop heating. Okay. Huh. Okay. So then how does it know when to stop? Or it, I, I was in Sweden, I was watching some of your presentations, and I was yeah. trying to understand what this icing range is because if it's warm enough obviously that there's no ice and it's it's so cold there's no ice there is a very narrow basically temperature band in which you're trying to prevent yeah. icing it's not very wide no yeah it's interesting because at colder temperatures there's not enough humidity in the air to cause icing yeah, right yeah so we are normally de-icing or anti-icing above minus five degrees celsius so between zero and minus five okay so that's a pretty narrow band of temperatures and that doesn't always exist it, it, what part or latitudes are you focused on? Is it, are, we, are you going all the way down to Texas as possible customers, like when they had the big ice storm in 2021? Yeah. Is that a potential customer? Or that is it sort is. of for, like South Dakota up? Okay, so I had always kind of thought of it before I got into this as a latitude thing, so northern regions would need icing. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, but it's interesting because you can have more southern latitudes that have a lot of humidity and when they get yep. okay. freezing temperatures then, it's worse. then sure. yeah yeah because you could because i mean uh, i'm from the northern midwest right so i've seen ice storms yeah that's one one style but then also if you haven't seen it before it's a really kind of a weird phenomenon but ice fog yes so ice but to me ice fog is like you see it sometimes and you can see it hanging in the air at like 100 meters and you're like mm. If that was a turbine up there, it would just be loading up with that stuff yeah. because of the temperature difference, right? It would it attaches right. to everything, yeah. and you can see it grow on like, you know, uh, telephone 
poles and stuff like that. Just it grows like crystals on them. Uh, and so ice fog, I would say, is bad. Um, can be, could be really bad, but there's only certain areas of the world that that happens in, right? And it's not necessarily latitude dependent. It's more... It's really like microclimate dependent. Yeah, yeah, so it's yeah, really yeah. hard to say where icing will be worse. And that's why a lot of predictions when they've done site assessments, uh, pre-construction for, for how bad their icing will be, they've had a hard time estimating it um, because, well, typically the they don't have liquid water content, historical yeah. measurements for liquid water content, which would be the best indicator. So they're using humidity um, and historical weather events, and it's not enough information to tell them how bad the icing right. will be. Wait, what's the difference between humidity and water content? So um, humidity, and this is not, I'm not a scientist, so, okay. so but humidity is how much water can be held in the air, okay. but liquid water content are the actual droplets of water okay. that are in the air. Okay, so it's the size of water droplets, not just that there's humidity, that there's moisture in the air, but the droplet size does matter. Well, not just droplet size and like quantity, like grams of droplets in the air but that are like suspended density, in like the air. Like a volumetric reading, almost. Yeah. The density of droplets. So if you want to know what Houston humidity is. It's always 90%. The fish swim in the air. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it's like down there. <laughs> All year round. Yeah. Well, that, that, that explains why when Texas got hit, they get hit hard yeah. over a wide region because it's pretty humid down there in the springtime, right? That's, yeah, absolutely. That, that'll bite you every time. So there's there's a uh, a number of customers that have run through this situation where they had uh, an icing study done, determined that they didn't need an anti-icing system. <laughs> they put the 80 turbines yeah. out in Wyoming and go, uh-oh, uh -oh, yeah. now what? Yeah. So that's where they call you. So walk yeah. me through what happens in that from sort of start to finish, phone rings, it's, I got 80 turbines, I have icing problems that I didn't <laughs> expect, what can you do for me? Okay, well, so yeah, we specialize in retrofits, so we'd be really excited that they called us, first sure, of all. For 80 turbines. For 80 turbines, yeah, nice, we would be nice job. cheersing our champagne glasses. And um, so we first look at their icing conditions and the type of the turbine model that they have. Okay. And so we're trying to determine the size of heater that they need. Um, so we look at the range of icing conditions they get, the their blade composition, so the, the thickness of the blade wall, the material or the epoxy that's used in the blade, so we know how hot we're, we can even heat the blade. Um, and then we recommend basically like the size of the heating system. We give them a breakdown, technical breakdown of what we would propose to install. And then, um, yeah, and then we go from there. Quick ROI study and away you go. Yep. So a question for you then, limitations. This is So this is something for a lot of the market, right? We talked, the original one we talked about, that Siemens 3.2, yep. it's a single shear web. Yep. What about a double shear web or a box beam blade or something like that? Can you, can you guys retrofit into all those different types? Yep. We've been working on our, on our blade adaption. So we do the double shear webs. We do blades that have bulkheads in them. Mm -hmm. A lot of the LM blades have the bulkheads, bulkheads, yeah. bulkheads in the tip. Yeah, so we have a tool that allows us to drill holes through the bulkheads, and this has all been reviewed with blade engineers. And we were actually we had the opportunity to talk with LM about it before we did it. So, um, fantastic, nice. Yeah, yeah, we've been working on our blade <laughs> adaptions. The box beam is one we actually haven't done yet because there, we haven't received that much demand for it until this year. We've actually had a lot of requests for it, so that might be one that we do next. Yeah, I mean, uh, just armchair knowledge there's a lot of box beam blades in latin america and some yeah. latitudes um, i don't know right. why i don't have a reason yeah. for it i've just seen them a lot more down there than i've seen them in the north so then i i, I was watching your linkedin page and i think there was a, a recent linkedin post about how much energy power you've recovered you want oh, to yeah. talk to that a little bit yeah i would love to talk about that so it's exciting because we almost doubled it from last year so as of last winter, we were at 7,000 megawatt hours of wind energy that wow. we'd recovered with our blade heating systems. And as of February this winter, we were at 5,000. So I think we haven't done the numbers yet uh, for the rest of the yeah. winter, but I think we may have doubled our number of amount of recovered wind energy. Wow. Is that just because it's just a, a worse winter? Is it, that was, what it, is? it was a harsh winter. We, have, we had more systems installed, so we okay, just completed sure. our biggest project, um, but it was a harsh winter. And a long winter. winter. Yeah, I That's know, true. like northern yeah. Wisconsin, the started early. Just that climate, I say climate adjustment, climate change, climate. I don't <laughs> want to start any fires online, but <laughs> the the amount of moisture that was in the air uh, over in the Alberta, that, that kind of stream that comes through there was crazy. 
I mean, we yeah. got we set record all of northern Minnesota, northern Wisconsin, uh, to even even western Minnesota got like they set all records for the amount of snow that they've ever got. Yeah, Duluth, Minneapolis, all of them. Well, the Sierra Nevadas, right? That yeah. they were at two hundred plus percent yeah. snowfall this year up in so, Nevada, California. Yeah. So as and the, so that's another thought here as well when you're talking about retrofits is they may have done the studies uh, when these wind farms were installed, but they were installed ten years ago, fifteen right. years ago. Oh, well, weather patterns tend to has changed change over time. Yeah. As as <laughs> as it goes, it's yeah. going to change a lot more. In particularly the areas that you guys are targeting for for work. Well, particularly that, and with global warming, with weather weather patterns changing there could be areas that didn't have icing before that yeah, will exactly. now have icing yeah or like texas they said that was a one in a hundred year storm and now they had another one this winter yeah so right. <laughs> yeah i drove through that one too <laughs> <laughs> so how does someone with an icing problem reach out to you obviously i mentioned your linkedin page how do, how do they find you and find borealis so the best way, so we have a contact us form on our website. You can reach us through there. So borealiswind.com and, uh, and LinkedIn is a great way. And we have some cool pictures and videos on our LinkedIn page of okay. turbines with our system, without our system. So yeah, it's awesome. Thermal camera stuff on there. And thermal camera pictures, yeah. which I think are really it's cool. Fantastic. Best. Thank you. They're the best for sure. Yeah. Well, Daniela, thank you for coming on the Uptime Podcast. We're really excited uh, how Borealis is doing, and we want to continue to follow you as the systems get installed across the United States and into Europe. So it's, it's a very exciting time. Uh, so thank you for being on the podcast. Yeah, it was a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you.